OK, so here we go in three, two. Good afternoon. I now call to order. Meeting of the Building and Contracts Committee for Monday, December 6, 2021. In accordance with the Board of Education's. Sorry, my. Board of Education's amended resolution approved at the October 13, 2020 board meeting in the event of a medical or health emergency related to COVID-19. The board chair in consultation with the vice chair and the superintendent may declare that a board meeting or a board committee meeting be held remotely in its entirety without the physical presence of board members or in a hybrid manner with only some individual board members participating remotely. Subject to the establishment of a mechanism that would allow each board member the opportunity to fully participate in the meeting despite not being physically present. And that would allow the public to also remotely attend those portions of the meeting that are open pursuant to the Maryland Open Meetings Act by being able to listen and or view those portions of the meeting. As a result, today's meeting is being held virtually and broadcast. In order to conduct this meeting efficiently, all voting items this afternoon will be done by a roll call vote. Board committee members will say their names before making and seconding a motion, as well as when requesting discussion on an agenda item. Ms. Slade, please call the roll to determine the presence of a quorum of the committee. Ms. Joes. Present. Mr. McMillian. Mr. McMillian. OK, Ms. Hun. Present. Mr. Kuhn. Mr. Offerman. Present. Thank you. Miss, um, did you, Miss Slate, did you call Miss Hen? I did, yes. Oh, okay. Yes. Present. Thank you. Mr. Corns, can you hear me? Yes, sir. Miss Slate, please call the role of staff members participating in today's meeting. Ms. Joes, may I confirm that was Mr. McMillian on the call? Yes, please. Mr. McMillian, are you present? Ms. Slate, I'll reach out to Mr. McMillian and see if I can get him in, okay? Okay, thank you. Um, I'm going to proceed with the staff. Uh, Ms. Anderson. Uh, Dr. Boswell McComas. Ms. Charlie Green. Dr. Wheatley Phillip. Present. Thank you. Dr. Yarborough. Dr. Zarchin. Ms. Howie. Ms. Rungfar Sangaroon. Present. Thank you. Ms. Lowry. Dr. Jones. Mr. Jim, how are you? I can't. Dr. Roberts. Um, Mr. Corns. Mr. Dixit. Present. Thank you. Mr. Patillo. Present. Mr. Saris. Present. Ms. Shea. Present. Dr. Grimm. Present. Mr. Plate. Present. Mr. Kenny West. Present. If there are additional staff participating that were not mentioned, please state your name now. Thank you all. Ms. Joes, I'm here. Rod McMillian. Thank you. Thank you. Mike Thank you. Archbold, Manager of Planning. Thank you. Are there any other board members present? Oh, all right. Thank you, Ms. Slade. Welcome. Welcome to hopefully the last BNC. 
Building and Contracts Committee meeting for 2021. I want to thank all staff members who've been working with the board and the committee uh, on these contracts, Mr. Saris, Mr. Dixit, Mr. Corns, Ms. Burnoff, Dr. Sarchin, Mr. Patillo, and many others, and, and you, Ms. Slade, that have worked behind the scenes in the Office of Purchasing as well. Uh, the board and this committee relies on your due diligence to approve these contracts, and we appreciate all of the work that goes towards bringing these contracts to the board. I would also like to thank my fellow committee members who've been very involved and supportive of BCPS by approving these contracts in a timely manner, so thank you, everybody. Mr. Saris, please state your name for the record and proceed. Uh, this is uh, George Saris, Executive Director of Fiscal Services, and uh, we have 17 items on the agenda for tonight. Uh, first of which, JMI 604-19 Mathematics Program Review. So uh, George, if I may interrupt you, my understanding was that there was a design presentation for board's review. Has that been postponed or I'm under the wrong impression? I don't have that answer, Pete. Mr. Saris, uh, Mr. Dixit, actually you are correct. There was a presentation at 4.30. Um, I would, can we start with the presentation? I mean, what would I have to do? Should I adjourn or um, recess this meeting, committee meeting, and then show the presentation, Mr. Dixon? We can continue with the meeting because, uh, but I'll leave it up to Mr. Saris and Ms. Slade, but I don't have any problem continuing it as part of the Building and Contracts Committee meeting. Ms. Um, Slade, can we continue with the meeting or can we um, adjourn or just hope, I guess? do the presentation first. I think we could do the presentation first because that's consistent with the published agenda. OK. Um, Are all committee members in uh, agreement to pause the Building and Contracts Committee meeting for the presentation? Yes. Yes. All right, thank you, um, committee members. So Mr. Dixit, you can proceed with the uh, presentation for the design presentation and we can change the slide. OK, so while we are changing the slide, I'll just give you a little bit of background information and some uh, reference to context here. Uh, as part of the capital program, board had approved project uh, including addition and renovation for Pine Grove Middle School. This is the project, as you will recall, is part of our strategy for taking care of the overcrowding issues on the eastern part of the county. So we are here with our team and uh, architect to present to you the design for the modified Pine Grove Middle School. We have worked closely with the school team uh, leadership, Ms. Byers, Ms. Sam, Mr. Sam Mustifer, and members of the Pine Grove Middle School Community Engagement Committee. Uh, I would also like for you to meet our, our inside in-house team uh, under the leadership of Merrill Plate, who's Director of uh, Construction and Improvement, Mr. Mike Archbold um, that you see right here in front. He's our Chief Architect and Manager of Planning, supported by Mohan Kohli, who is the project manager. Uh, I don't know if he was able to make it or not. And with that, I would like Ms. Grace Hyland from Crabtree Rohrbach and Associate to deliver the presentation for your review. So what you see in front of you is Ms. Grace Hyland. So are we able to project the presentation now? Yes, hi, good evening. Going to share my screen. Can everyone can everyone see that? Yes, yeah. I can see this. OK. Thank you um, for the introduction, Mr. Dixit. Um, Grace Highland with Crabtree Bourbon Associates, and I'm very excited to be here tonight to uh, present virtually um, the design for Pine Grove Middle School.
This is just the agenda for my presentation. <clears throat> Pine Grove Middle School was constructed originally in 1972 um, as an open plan school, and I will illustrate what that means later in the presentation. Um, but as a result of this particular type of uh, uh, layout and um, configuration of the building, although the existing student rated capacity is 1197, um, the building can only really support uh, around 926 students, with it, which is the current enrollment. Um, <clears throat> so this project, in addition to building 12 classroom addition and support spaces, will completely reorganize the interior of the building. Um, we'll provide corridor access to each of the classrooms and improve wayfinding throughout the school. Um, and the vast majority of this building has not been renovated in decades, so um, the project will also um, mod modernize and renovate those portions of the building, as well as improving um, uh, site safety and security. Uh, this slide shows the location of Pine Grove Middle School. Um, you can see the one and two mile radiuses and the elementary schools that feed into Pine Grove Middle School. Zooming out, just a little farther, you see the six mile radius and we're showing the middle schools in the general vicinity as well as the high schools close by. The project site is almost 35 acres, uh, which is a large site. Uh, however, we're only uh, modifying the area of the site that's close to the building. Um, it's situated along Old Harford Road and Proctor Lane. So zooming into that portion of the site um, closest to the building there that you see, um, this is the main entrance to the building, with the red arrow um, and the service entrance that you see there. Uh, the blue arrows are indicating the queuing, uh, the, the parent drop off queuing um, for the school, which is really inadequate. Um, and one of the things that we want to address on the site. Um, creates a lot of congestion along Old Hartford Road. <clears throat> the yellow arrows indicate the bus loop, bus drop-off area, and you can see um, that the bus and parent, parent drop-off um, vehicular circulation conflicts, which is a safety concern that we want to address. Um, and there are currently only 97 parking spaces, so we want to um, add some parking to the site as well. <clears throat> Um, <clears throat> this is the proposed site plan for the building. Um, and I do want to point out this is the location of our new addition here in the gray. Um, the main entrance is remaining where it is, as well as the service entrance. Uh, but we are greatly expanding upon the, the parent drop off queuing area. Um, we'll be able to fit 54 passenger cars in the full queue, as well as 25 cars right adjacent to the building. We'll be providing an additional, um, <clears throat> additional parking with 166 basis total. And then the uh, yellow arrows are indicating the bus drop off the bus loop, the new bus loop, which is completely separated from the parent drop off traffic. This is the floor plan of the existing building uh, with the first floor uh, uh, to the left there and the second floor that you see up to the right. I wanna point out first, um, the second floor is where the administration suite is. Um, and although um, this is the only area of the building that actually has windows is the administration suite on the second floor, um, there is no line of sight to the front entrance of the school. Um, and there is no secure vestibule. So that is something that we are going to rectify with this project. On the lower, on the, on the first floor, um, that area uh, that's circled um, right as you come in the main entrance is uh, banks of lockers, large banks of lockers. And I have a photo of that area. Um, you can see this is a, an area that's very particularly difficult to supervise with a lot of hiding places. Um, so we are going to reclaim that space for another purpose. Um, the library is located in this area um, and it is completely open to the corridor. Um, so 
photo of that space and you can see the bookshelves lining the corridor around the perimeter there. Materia is located in this area here. And a photo of that space. It also is completely open to the corridor, so there's a lot of uh, noise, as you can imagine, bleeding out into the into the rest of the building, which is um, a concern as well as safety. Um, this area here, I'm I'm going to zoom into this area, that typical classrooms. Um, so this is an enlarged portion of the original floor plan of the building when it was first constructed. So you can see those wide open spaces, um, some of which are uh, 65 feet across. Um, open plan concepts were very popular in the early 70s, and the idea is that by eliminating walls between the classrooms, you're encouraging collaboration. But in practice, it led to a lot of challenges, including um, visual distraction, noise, so this is a floor plan of what that area of the school currently looks like. You can see a lot of partitions have been added, um, but as a result, students are, need to walk from one classroom into another in order to um, get access to the corridor. Uh, so for example, if you're in classroom 20 there, that red line is showing the route you'd have to take to get to, to the corridor, and you'd have to pass through three different classrooms to get there. Just to show you a photo um, if, uh, taken of that area there um, in red, um, a lot of the classrooms don't even have doors. So that's a big concern as far as noise. And it's just very confusing um, to, to find your way around the building. So this is a floor plan of our, our, proposed, our proposed layout, <coughs> proposed floor plan. Um, we are moving the administration suite from the second floor down to the first floor um, close to the main entrance with a new secure vestibule we're adding windows in the administration suite uh, for good visual control of the front of the site this is the location of our addition and um, just really wanted to highlight the new corridor system um, and the total reorganization of the entire interior of the building. Every single classroom will have access to the corridor. The sixth grade is located in this area, seventh grade here, and eighth grade in that location. So each grade has their own area of the building. Um, we're adding ELAs or extended learning areas in between each of the classrooms for um, breakout spaces for learning. So each team will have its own collaboration space, which is an open, flexible space um, open to the corridor that multiple classrooms can um, collaborate. You see those circled in red there. It's a rendering of one of those collaboration spaces. Um, they'll be outfitted with a variety of flexible um, furniture systems, uh, technology, as well as um, marker boards. We are also adding windows to bring natural light into the interior of the school. This is the eighth grade collaborative learning space. Um, so you can see each, each grade will have its own color that identifies it in the building and helps with wayfinding. Now I'm coming back to the, the floor plan um, for a moment. I just wanted to point out a couple of other spaces here. The learning commons, if you remember, that was the area that was the um, open banks of lockers. We're converting that into the new learning commons, which will be completely enclosed. With a, uh, a new maker space, which I'll show you renderings of in a moment. The cafeteria is remaining in its current location but it's being expanded to seat 490 students with the um, getting more students into the building. Um, we're expanding the cafeteria and it will be fully enclosed. The gymnasium is remaining in its current location. Um, however, we are uh, totally reconfiguring the locker room areas. Those areas are being renovated. Um, Brecken Parks will have its own um, exterior access or access from the exterior area of the building. And this slide just shows how um, 
The academic wings of the building can be locked down for after hours event events. Um, we have a series of security doors that can be closed. Um, and so the public will really only have access to the, the public areas of the building. And then this is another way that the, that the building can be uh, locked down. We can provide access only to the gym, locker room, and um, rec and parks area. Um, and the gym has its own entrance there. Um, and we are providing a new um, uh, uh, covering for that entrance, a new canopy. Here's a rendering of the media center. Um, another rendering of the of the media new media center. We're providing multiple uh, teaching areas within that space. This is the maker space that's located right off of the media center. And this is a rendering of the cafeteria. Um, Again, it will be fully enclosed um, and it will also function as a space to hold performances and presentations as it does currently. Going back to the floor plan for a moment, uh, the science classrooms are located here. They are not being um, intensively renovated since they were renovated um, more recently. Uh, these are the tech labs, though they will be fully renovated areas. Um, and the tech labs have their own collaboration space, um, <clears throat> as you see there. The visual arts is classrooms are located in that area of the building. Their own collaboration space. Um, and the music is located in, uh, in this general area. I have a rendering of the tech, tech lab. This is the, um, the collaboration space right off of the tech lab area. This is the other tech lab. And next I have a fly through. Um, <clears throat> fly through of the building. So this is the, you know, the site plan, um, the new addition here in the gray. And we're coming in the sidewalk uh, between the the bus drop off area and the parent drop off area. This is the um, new, the existing entrance canopy coming underneath and into the new secure vestibule. So you've come into the vestibule and then be buzzed into the reception area. And next we'll be popping out into the um, the corridor and then this is the media center right in front of you as you come in the main entrance doors see a variety of flexible furniture in the media center and right in front of us here is the makerspace which we'll enter next so again we have flexible furniture we have pull down cord reels um, and some casework. This is coming down the eighth grade corridor wing, um, that yellow area. And you'll see there's there are lockers lining the corridors. All those lockers that we took out of the interior area of the school, we are um, removing those and we're replacing them with lockers along the corridors. Much easier to supervise. This is the sixth grade um, collaboration space in the sixth, sixth grade uh, wing of the building. You'll see we've added um, windows at the end of the corridors for natural daylight. This is a typical classroom. Take a look around in, and then that's the extended learning area there that's shared between two classrooms. And there's glazing in between the ELA and the classrooms to allow the teachers to supervise that space. This is one of the tech labs that we're entering now. This area of the building was that open library area that I showed you. Um, it's being enclosed and convert it into the tech labs.
And this is the other tech lab. Let's take a look around in this space. And finally, this is the cafeteria. Coming in, the kitchen is off to your right. And this is so this is an existing high volume space here that we're just enclosing with walls and we're enlarging it. Okay. Uh, I believe this is my last slide. Um, just showing the schedule. We're wrapping up design. It will be complete next month. Um, and then uh, construction will start um, dependent on the availability of funding. Are there any questions? Thank you. Uh, board members, any questions? Mr. Offerman, yes. Joe's. Hi, this is Rod McMillian. Go ahead, Mr. McMillian. And Mr. Offerman, you can go next. Yeah, I, I taught for years in an open space building that was that was, you know, reconfigured. I'm just curious what kind of 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 emphasis or what's been done about the heating and air conditioning now that that things are being moved around or they is all the duct work and all being moved to accommodate the new building we're reusing as much of it as we can but yes as, as you can imagine with all the spaces that are being re reconfigured um there's there's a lot of work there that that is being done <clears throat> But we're reusing a lot of the air handlers and equipment and just uh, rerouting things. Everything will be fully um, rebalanced as well. Any other questions? Mr. Yeah, Offerman. Mr. Offerman here. Uh, Am I correct in saying that the field space located essentially behind the building will be basically unchanged? Is that correct or am yes. I mistaken? Yes, that is okay. correct. Thank you. The windows you're installing, are they in the hallways or the or are any of them in the uh, in the actual classrooms? They are um, in the hallways and at the ends of corridors um, due to the um, the existing structural system, um, we were kind of limited as to how many openings we could make in the exterior, um, but we are kind of strategically locating them to maximize the amount of daylight that we're bringing in. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. I noticed that, that to the office space as well. Yes. Okay. Uh, I noticed that, that at the doorways of the classrooms, there are not only doorways, but there are also glass allowing people to see in and out of the uh, in and out of the room. Is that correct? Yes, yeah. we do have a, a blind system that we're installing as oh, well. Thank you. That's mm -hmm. what thank you very much. I'm done. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Alferman. Uh, could you display the schedule slide again? Uh, and Ms. Hen, if you have a question, go ahead. Thank you, Ms. Joes. Um, I that was my one question. I also wanted to ask if the shared um, spaces between the classrooms, um, if there were separate entrances to each of those classrooms in addition to, or if if the navigation was through the shared space. And I'm thinking about the current layout and it sounds like you've addressed that, but is that something you could speak to? In terms I can of speak to that a little bit. The um, the collaborative spaces are designed for the different teams. So we have um, three different teams within the different grade levels. And so there's collaborative spaces associated with that team directly adjacent to their the classrooms that will that use that space. Um, and so it's, it's intended to uh, in, in enhance and provide the teams with additional flexible learning spaces. Thank you. But in terms of traffic flow, there each of the classrooms will have their own entrances. They yeah. won't. 
they won't have to travel through the collaborative spaces. No. To the classrooms. Okay. Thank you. Any more questions, board members? Um, hearing that, I do have a quick question. If you could go back to the slide that shows the parking spaces. Uh, Mr. Dixon, I don't know if you can answer this. How many parking spaces are needed and how many are being provided? And is there a way to get parking outside of the school, like a community center that's close by so people could walk? So there are 166 spaces, which is pretty good number. It's a lot more than what they have now. So if you see the site work here in the front, this is totally different than what we have now. If you go there now, it's a very few number, small number of parking spaces. And then there's 65 additional overflow event parking. Uh, I don't know, Mike, maybe you can help me old Harford Road. Do we have additional parking on the side of that street? Uh, there is existing street parking along the Harford Road, but we were trying to maximize and get all of the school's traffic and parking requirements met on the site itself with those additional spaces. So this was a major issue, Ms. Joes, uh, in that building. That's why we spent a lot of time uh, in designing these spaces here in the front that you see. Did we okay, answer so your question? Yeah, you did. And I do like the separate bus loop that definitely helps with um, school dismissal and arrival. So we have worked closely with our transportation department. Uh, uh, Dr. Grimm has been extremely helpful, him and his team in helping us figure out how to design this space. And obviously we have a lot of our own experience too. All right, thank you uh, for the presentation. Thank, thank you very much. Yeah. And thank, thank you. you, Gail. Thank you. Mr. Saris, please state your name for the record and proceed with presenting contract number one. This is George Saris, Executive Director of Fiscal Services. And the first item we have is uh, JMI 604-19 Mathematics Program Review. And this is a contract modification to extend the term of this contract by one year. Thank you, Mr. Sarah's committee members. Any questions? Hearing none, Mr. Sarah's, please proceed to the next contract. Thank you. The next item, GDA 300-22, Social Emotional Mindfulness Based Intervention. This is a new competitively bid contract to provide training on mindfulness-based practices for the Office of School Climate Approval is requested for a five-year contract with two recommended bidders and contract spending authority of $500,000. Thank you, Mr. Sarris. Committee members, any questions? Hi, Ms. Jose. Uh, this is Mr. Kuhn. I have a few questions about this one. Go ahead. Thank you. Um, Mr. Sarris, I'm looking at this and I, I see that we have two separate um, two separate contractors and they seem one is called rethink autism and the other one is manage mindfully or move this world um, and I've looked at both of their um, their presences online to try and get flavor for what they do so it seems as if they're in different um, spaces uh, so can you can you talk to what each one is going to be focusing on? Are we are we buying training from them? What are we buying from them? So I do not have that information, but I think Dr. Zarchin or one of his staff would be best to address that question. 
Dr. Zarchin, could you good answer? Yes, good afternoon. So, I, I, unfortunately, I was not able to get a staff member here to speak directly to that, so we may need to come back um, when I can get uh, somebody who's more involved. Um, I, it is two vendors. Um, it's, it's fully funded, but beyond that, I would have to have somebody here who can speak to the specifics. Okay, and can you speak to the funding? I see it's it's there are grants, but what grants are funding this? So that information again, unfortunately, I would have to have um, one of the folks who's been working directly with this to report out. Um, oh. On that point, I can let you know that we have. Um, uh, social emotional support is part of of the federal ESSER funding that we receive both directly from uh, the federal government as well as a pass through from the state of their funds. So um, this is obviously a, a big concern that links to the pandemic. Um, so that would be the source of the funds here. So this says it's a five year contract. And my understanding is the ESSER grants are not five year grants. Is that correct? That's correct. OK, so and my guess is that. You know, this is the typical term for which we do a contract. If these services are determined to be useful, uh, we could fund them from another source. Okay, beyond, but your expectation would be a, a grant. Pardon? Uh, uh, so you said possibly another source in the future, right? And I'm tracking you and I'm trying to f follow through the logic because that makes sense, right? If we like it, we'd like to find funding for it even after the ESSER funds are gone. Is your, since, since we're saying it's it's grants here at, at the point in time where we need to fund it with a different source. Would you be coming back to us to talk about that? Or how does the board, how's the board become aware yeah. of a change there? We would do a modification. Well, you're not actually modifying a grant or I'm sorry, you're not modifying a contract because you've already said we're contracting with you for five years and the board has said, yeah, we'll give you $500,000 over that but five years, correct? The, the board is uh, accepting these services provided they are grant funded as we've stipulated. But uh, if we don't have a grant and we don't have a regular operating budget, uh, if we don't have a grant, we would notify the board that these funds are going to be provided through the operating budget. All right, thank you. Sure. Thank you, Mr. Kuhn. Ms. Hen, do you have a question? I do. Thank you, Ms. Joes. Um, good evening, Mr. Saris and Dr. Zarchin. Um, the exhibit we were provided says that these vendors signed the student data privacy agreement, I believe, in October. And I'm wondering what data we are collecting if these services are for training on mindfulness practices and why it would be relevant that these vendors would need to sign a student data privacy agreement. I do not have that information. I'm sorry. Is that something Dr. Zarchin could speak to? I'm not aware of any student data that would be collected with this. Is that that something um, the member of your team could possibly speak to? We can follow up and I apologize. We had a scheduling conflict and I couldn't get folks here who needed to be here, but we can follow up. OK, will they be available in in our session tomorrow when these contracts are discussed? I can have some, yes, I can have someone available. Thank you. You're welcome. You. Dr. Sartin, if you could also respond to those questions via email. Uh, I'm kind of curious why they would even need um, student data. So if you could respond via email so all board members could um, get 
those answers. I'll be happy to do that. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Sarris, please proceed. Hearing no more questions, uh, Mr. Sarris, please proceed with the next contract. Thank you. The next item, LKO 400-20, Human Resources and Financial Management System Software. This is a contract modification to provide for the continued use of our human resources and financial management system enterprise software. Approval is requested to extend the contract for two years and, ex and increase contract spending authority by $9,395,983, bringing the revised total contract spending authority to $22,180,000. $983,000 with the vendor approved by the board in August 2019. Thank you, Mr. Sarris. I do have some questions, but uh, Mr. Offerman, do you have any questions? Mr. McMillian? Mr. Kuhn, no, go thank ahead. Thank you. Hi, Mr. Sarris. Uh, thank you. Um, I believe we've talked about this. I think this is the one we keep coming back to and talking about because it seems to, or maybe it's not, because there's a number of, of IT, large IT uh, contracts out there. And I guess I would like a little understanding about the 9.3 million. Is that is that what it costs over two years for everything associated with the human resources and financial management software that's being used by BCPS right now? Uh, that is actually a revision of, of what it will cost um, in addition to what, in addition to the 12.8 million that we've already um, taken, uh, received the board's approval for. So, uh, the contract, as you may remember, uh, last year under emergency uh, circumstances, we had to move the uh, the ERP system from our servers to the cloud, and we signed a uh, a one year agreement uh, to do that for approximately $1.5 million. And having made that transition, uh, we now need to amend the uh, contract for two things. The first of which is that ongoing annual uh, maintenance for the cloud-based services, which uh, initially last year we told the board we would reevaluate and come back to you if we decided to stay on that cloud-based platform and and we have made that decision and that's why we're we're bringing this to you so there is an additional one million dollars per year for the remaining uh part of the contract uh for the cloud-based services and the additional fees are an optional amount which would be based because the current version of the software that we're using uh, is going to be upgraded and just as we did in 2019 uh, if we wish to maintain this service with this vendor we will need to upgrade uh, to their most current version in order to retain uh, the ongoing support from the vendor for the licensing that we we already pay for. So uh, those factors combined uh, have brought us back to add in the the ongoing cloud services as well as the uh, potential uh costs for the upgrade in future years all right let me i'm gonna try to send it now hold on one second 
So. Let me see if I can forward this to you. Hi, Mr. Mr. Saris. Um, yeah, Mike, you may want to mute your. Hold on one second. Thank you. All right, I think you muted. Um, just to follow on, so I'm, I'm looking at the sheet that you provided and um, we're revising the total up to $22 million. Right. And it says that the life com lifetime contract expenditures has, up to this point has been 4 million. So if we've added two years to the, the date, I'm just trying to understand what we're spending per year because it seems like it's significantly more than $2 million a year going forward. Can you just explain uh, that to me? Yeah, it will be. And let me just bring this uh, pricing agreement up here and certainly I'm happy to provide that because it's, it's much easier to see uh, in an illustrated format. So the um, we have annually the cloud fee of $1.1 million and our current annual maintenance licensing fee of 951,000. So that's uh, about 2.05 million per year. The, um, the additional fees for the transition uh, to the cloud, uh, let's see, are uh, 1.4 million and the upgraded uh, service, in other words, the, the increased uh, service to their more their most recent platform is another 2.9 million. Um, and at that point, the uh, the structure of the annual maintenance fees uh, fall back to uh, to two million, just over two million dollars annually. So. Um, so the, the baseline for this current upcoming year, 2.05 million, would go to 4 million, 4.5 million, and then back down to 2 million um, in the fifth year if we move forward with the, uh, the upgrade. But we're not bound by that. Okay, well, thank you for uh, clarifying that. Um, and I'll send this to the board so that you all have this uh, for tomorrow. Great, I think that'll get ahead of a lot of questions you'll probably get. And just so I'm clear, you said that there's a $1.4 million transition cost associated with that. Is that in essence kind of a one-time fee from going to our system to the cloud? Yes. That's that's a one time fee and the upgrade. So in other words, the 1.4 and the 2.9 million are both one time fees to to move us on to the vendors most current version of the software. And then they they basically lower their annual fees after we make that transition because future upgrades will be included in the baseline price. So um, that'll be a change in their their pricing model after 2026. Okay, and and just, um, and this is called Advantage Management Software? Uh, the company is CGI, and the CGI group. Th this particular application, um, is what they call advantage. There's there's human resources and financial advantage, and that's that's their ERP system for uh, local government and and in our and school systems. 
Okay, that's just the product name. I just, yeah. Okay, thank you. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Kuhn. Uh, Ms. Hen, do you have any questions or did Mr. Kuhn ask you a question? I, I have a few more. <laughs> Thanks, Ms. Sure. Joes. Um, Mr. Saris, um, of the, the 22 million lifetime, um, and I understand this is through 2026 anticipated expenditures, do you have any idea um, what portion of those are in response to or related to the ransomware recovery? And I, I know that's partly, and Mr. Kuhn asked this, migration to the cloud product, but had we continued to say the course with the product we had been on, what would our costs look, have looked like through 2026? So for the ransomware attack. So these additional fees are unrelated to the ransomware attack. Um, we, uh, the board approved, I believe, um, last de December, ultimately in February, um, approximately $535,000 in consulting fees um, that are directly related to having to make the transition to the cloud as a result of the cyber attack. And I believe, let's see, I think we also approved an additional similar amount uh, through December of 2022 uh, to for consulting services to continue to support us in this uh, transition, this emergent transition that we made. Um, typically there are, as you, in our current model, there's gonna be uh, another transition fee projected in 2025, but those two amounts that the board approved really from December of 20 to December of 22, are are more directly related to the cyber attack. OK, for consulting services related right. to the migration, then the there really is no differential between the products themselves. Where the costs are vastly different in comparison. Correct. To the yeah, two products. OK, that's helpful. Thank you. And my second question then is you had mentioned at some point a decision was made, I would imagine before that, before the board approved those consulting um, contracts then to stay with Advantage or CGI in, in terms of the product um, or an ERP system, but that decision was made. We, I wonder what well, the cost benefit analysis looked like versus going to other products. Can you speak to that? Yeah, we, CGI, of course, was willing to offer us either a 10 year or a five year agreement. Mm -hmm. And uh, the five year agreement is slightly more expensive, but um, we do believe that once a new chief information officer is named, that uh, the Department of Information or the Division now of Information Technology may want to review where we are uh, with the recovery and with our long term needs and and they may recommend another direction. But even if we were to decide tonight that we want to go in a different direction, it would take two to three years to do that. And so uh, obviously we need to keep operating during that period of time. And there, this contract does not involve any penalties if we should, if that's the decision the system should make. And so there's really no additional costs other than some discounts we could have gotten by signing a 10 year agreement. So we felt comfortable bringing this to the board because it gives us a, a very reasonable window 
uh, in which to evaluate our long term strategy uh, without any real financial penalties. OK, but there's still runway left. I mean, the, the prior end date that the board approved is 2024. So what's being requested right. is the additional spending authority and two more years. So right. um, if we wanted to wait until the CIO was on board to provide input into that decision, um, we certainly could without adversely affecting um, business continuity. Is that it? Well, statement? not entirely because the, the cloud services agreement that was approved last year expires tomorrow. So in order to keep operating on the cloud, which we the staff does agree that we we don't we want to continue in this environment having made that transition, uh, we do need to sign uh, to renew our current agreement and uh, so that uh, that's why we would request that the board approve a uh, this five-year term rather than one year at a time given that there's no pricing penalty or termination penalty for doing that now so if you could help me understand then why the cloud agreement terms are not in alignment with what we are approving in LKO 400-20. It sounds because like it's it's still not under emergent circumstances of, of the system failure last year. So that's the contract we brought to the board last year. So that would be a, a different approval then that that the board that would be brought to the board should it expire tomorrow. Is that being brought separately? No, it's all incorporated in this one agreement. Um, the um, the cloud agreement was a statement of work and with a very specific time frame and, and cost amount. Um, and we are we want to renew the agreement because we need these services uh, in you know in the near term and uh, we typically bring either a five or a ten year contract to the board and we needed some uh, some multi we needed some future going certainty in order to keep operating and and making decisions about where to go next. So OK, and and I apologize if if we approve this, what does that do to the cloud agreement? Does that also extend it through 2026 so that the two yeah. become in sync? Yes, this brings everything into alignment. I guess that's probably what you were asking, but yeah. Um, so this brings everything into alignment and um, it, it will probably be clearer when I send you this uh, illustration, but uh, yes, that's the idea. Thank you, Mr. Okay. Sears. Thank you. And in the interest of time, um, it seems like board members are having a little bit of difficulty understanding some of the nuances of these contracts. If you could send more details um, via email prior to the board meeting, that would be really helpful. And if there are no more questions, Mr. Saris, please proceed with the next contract. Certainly. Uh, JBS 716-21 School Bus and Student Safety Initiative. This is a new competitively bid contract for a school bus and student safety program for the Office of Transportation. Uh, approval is requested for a five-year contract with one recommended bidder and uh, at no cost. Thank you, Mr. Saris. Um, Mr. McMillian, do you have any questions? I'll defer my questions after Mr. Kuhn and some of these other people. Thank you. 
All right, Mr. Offerman, do you have any questions? Hearing none, um, Ms. Hen, do you have any questions? I do, thank you, Ms. Joes. Um, Mr. Sears, other LEAs have structured their agreements with bus patrol such that bus patrol um, needs to recover their costs before any revenue sharing is in place. Do you know if that's the case um, with our agreement? And if so, what is the um, amount of costs, initial um, upfront costs that bus patrol would need to recover? And what are the details of the revenue sharing agreement beyond that initial cost recovery? So I'm going to let Mr. Patillo and his staff address those provisions if they are available. Yeah, good afternoon, Ms. Hinn, and thank you for that question. I'm going to ask Kenny um, yeah. West, who worked intimately with this contract, to uh, answer your question. Thank you. Wes? Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Ms. Hinn. Thank you for that question. Um, so. Uh, just to make sure I understood it, the question is, does does our contract with bus patrol require or allow for bus patrol to recover all of their costs prior to revenue share? Is that correct? Yes, sir. OK, um, so no, it does not. Um, the the contract requires or calls for a revenue share the very first month where a citation would be issued. So revenue sharing starts immediately, if you will. Um, the, the same month the a citation will be issued. Thank you. Um, just to pick, piggyback off that question, um, is there any memorandum of understanding between Baltimore County Public Schools, Baltimore County Police Department, or Baltimore County Government that identifies the responsibilities of each of these parties? And could you share that with the board? Um, so the memorandum of understanding that would need to exist has to is is um, produced after approval of a contract. Um, however, the contract actually or the, the the request for proposals as it was written actually speaks to what the obligations of each entity are. Um, and I can just go over them really quickly for you. Basically, yeah, the school system um, owns, if you will, the, the contract. And there is a very specific reason for that. The reason why the school system owns the contract is because the very spirit, the very essence of this contract is student safety. And so no one does student safety on school buses except us. And so because it is rooted in student safety, we own that contract. Um, where the other agreements come in place is because of one component of this agreement, which uh, of this contract, which um, is the exterior uh, exterior violation um, cameras. So the, the cameras on the outside of the buses that would capture motorists who are violating the stop arm law. Um, that component involves the police department because there will be the enforcement arm, if you will. They're the entity that is approving or rejecting the citations and um, therefore the agreement with them has to exist. And uh, subsequently, um, the Baltimore County Government um, Office of Budget and Finance is involved because they will take over ensuring that the citations are sent into court and are subsequently collected um, as they do currently with the speed cameras and red light um, cameras with the, throughout the county. And additionally, um, the the way it is structured is all revenue uh, this goes right to the county. So because we are not interested in revenue generation because it is not the the purpose of this, that revenue does go to the county. The ordinance that was written and approved by the county council last year, uh, May of 2020, the ordinance that is written requires that all revenue generated from this initiative be used for public safety purposes. And so 
the county government and police department are responsible for allocating how they will spend that revenue. And lastly, one of the other components of this project um, is a public service or community education component, which is actually really integral to the to this project. The objective actually is to educate the motoring public and make them more aware of safety in and around school buses. And one of the ways that is done is Baltimore County school system and the police department come together and we say, here's our target audience. That would be the motoring public of Baltimore County. And here is what we want the message to be. And the vendor will be responsible for putting together um, that public education component. And that can be done via um, any number of, of modes of communication. But that is an integral requirement for the project. Thank you. And my follow up question to that is, are any of the parties responsible then for um, bus patrols costs, whether it be the equipment or operating costs or startup costs with implementing this program for BCPS? Yes, yeah, so bus patrol is solely responsible for it. The way it works is bus patrol incurs all of the costs from purchasing all the equipment, from installing the equipment, um, for maintaining it, for replacing it, should mm -hmm. the camera or something go down. Um, so they're responsible for all of those, those upfront costs and ongoing costs. So just to clarify, Ms. Um, if there are no costs, there will be no add-ons over the years that BCPS will have to pay for, i.e. hidden costs that may come in two years or three years from now. That is, is absolutely that correct. Cool. That's absolutely correct. Okay. And so the project is 100% funded by revenue fines, I take uh, violation fines. It's 100% funded by that. And actually, um, there will be some costs that are incurred just from the processing of the program. So the police department, um, they already have a, a system in place through their red light cameras that they have throughout the county and their speed cameras. They have officers who approve and reject them. And there's a cost to those officers because of the increased volume that our program will add. The police department is slated to add on officers. There's also um, a cost borne by the the Office of Budget and Finance to process them to get them to court to the collection piece, and that's through the Baltimore County's uh, Budget and Finance. So when you add those two together, there is a cost that the, the county will incur. However, it is in the contract that those costs will be the county will notify bus patrol on a quarterly basis to say, here's how much our costs are, and bus patrol will actually give the county or reimburse the county for all of those costs out of the fine, the fine revenue. So there is no cost that the county will incur even in the processing of the citations. There is no cost to, to uh, the, the county or the school system. And right. is there a minimum number of citations that the bus patrol is assuming or building into the agreement that they expect to um, receive as an based on normal uh, motorist habits? Sure, and um, basically the way they calculated that is given the trends that they have seen in other jurisdictions, they'll say, okay, well, Baltimore County, um, you have run X number of routes. Actually, we gave them that information to say, this is how many routes we expect to run on a daily basis. You tell us what the projected um, revenue could be. Um, so based on that, they do say, well, here's how many citations we believe would come out of a system of your size, um, given the number of buses that you have. However, um, it's important to note that there is no maximum or minimum. Again, because it is rooted in student safety, ideally, they would issue no citations. And if we issue no citations, that means that there were no violations. So in a perfect world, we would educate so well that there are no motorists who are committing violations of, of state law by blowing through a school bus's stop arms when we're making a stop. 
Um, we know that that is just not been the case, given all the implementations across the country. Um, that's not the case. So, um, however, to your point, I think where you're where you're getting at, if the if the revenue did not meet whatever their projections were, bus patrol is still responsible for supplying all of the components that the 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 comprehensive package calls for. The county, the um, the board's so liability is, does not change. Thank sorry? you, Ms. Hunt, could you? The board's liability does not change. That is correct. We are not financially liable for any of that. Ms. Hand, if you have any additional questions, could you hold on? I'll move on to Mr. Kuhn and circle back to you. Mr. Kuhn, could you, do you have any questions? I do, thank you. This is um, this is an interesting contract and we've heard a lot about it from the public and I actually sent some questions for it. So hopefully we can get to um, the nuts and bolts of all of it now. Um, I appreciate what you've shared so far and I understand that things are not free. This company is not doing this for some reason uh, just because it feels good. They expect a revenue stream and that revenue stream they expect will provide a profit to them. So my first question is, and uh, you know, I think you already answered it, so I'm, I'm very happy to hear that, but um, you said that uh, bus patrol incurs all costs and even if there are zero citations, the county and Baltimore County Public Schools do not owe bus patrol one penny. Yes, sir, that is correct. All right, great. Now, we have um, our own buses and we have many, many routes that are covered by contractors. What are you doing with, are the contractor buses going to be outfitted with this? Mr. Kuhn, that is a, a fantastic question. A, an integral part of this contract is that not only are all contractor buses covered, but all spare buses. And the reason for that is very intentional. We do not want at any time to ever say that one bus or route was prioritized over another. So all Baltimore County buses, including spare buses, and all contractor buses, including their spare buses, will be fitted with all equipment. They're, so um, all of our contractors, before they can operate a bus for us, we have to inspect that. So uh, we know any potential bus that would be on the road transporting any BCPS child, every bus that is certified to do so will have the full uh, complement, the full suite of, of products. Great, thank you for the answer. Um, how does the revenue move? So the question is, a ticket's generated, it goes out to a citizen, because these are all Baltimore County tax paying citizens most likely, right? Um, and then money moves to an entity. Mm -hmm. Does that move directly to the county or does this go directly to bus patrol? Also a great question. Um, so the way it works is, citation is, is generated, bus patrol staff do a cursory mm -hmm. review of the citation. They have certain criteria that they're looking for um, and uh, but everything is, is available to the police department. Um, so they can see that bus patrol says, we don't think these citations are valid citations for whatever reason, um, based on the criteria that, that is set. Um, the police department can see those, but they say, we think these citations are valid and they will, um, they're available for the police department to approve and reject them. And there's, there's, um, there's complete transparency in that whole process. Um, so the police department ultimately is the entity that approves or rejects. Once it is approved as a valid citation, bus patrol is responsible for issuing these citations. So they will print it out. Um, uh, it's called an evidence package. They will print it out and mail that to the, to the citizen. Um, the citizen will then need to make payment. Um, and so all the funds that come in actually go into a third party. So it's like a, um, a holding account, if you will. And a lot of this is for 
audit purposes. Um, that bus patrol doesn't directly receive those funds. This goes into a, uh, another account. And at that point, say for example, at the end of the month, um, the cost that I, we talked about earlier with the county, so the county's staffing costs from the police department and from the Office of Budget and Finance, that is taken out. Um, after that, then there's what's called the revenue split. And so bus patrol gets a portion and then Baltimore County uh, government gets a portion. Um, and from that revenue split, the monthly technology fees are paid. OK, great, thanks. That's that's great. I do have many, many questions and details I would like to ask, but I don't want to burn everybody's time. Um, I have questions around what is the processing fee for sending the citations out and how much does bus patrol charge us for that? Um, who is actually moving the money? Because it sounds like it's an electronic you know, transaction and or a check being mailed somewhere. There are bank fees associated with that. You know, how much does that cost? Um, and then here's, you know, if there are actually no, no, you know, hopefully, and, and I hope we get there at some point, um, you, you know, you started by talking about educating the public. And I'm, I'm curious as to who's involved in that, because that sounds kind of like a Baltimore County government activity and it's not our activity, it's not bus patrol's activity. So it's kind of outside the discussion of this. Is there, is there a cost associated with that or something associated with that that we can discuss or is that just outside of this, this discussion? I don't think it's outside of this discussion. Um, so I'll tell you how the contract was construct was um, designed. It is designed that that is a requirement of the project. So uh, community education is a um, integral uh, component. And how we determine what that communication is, that is comprised of the Office of Transportation and the uh, Police Department. And so the reason why it's, it's Office of Transportation is because um, Comar actually requires us to do PSAs. Um, so you'll notice at the very start of every school year, there's some type of communication with the public saying school buses are skin on the road. Um, please be very aware. Some of that is actually mandated by, the, by state law. And so um, we are required to, to increase awareness. All LEAs in the state are required to do that. Um, the police department and both and, and transportation, we are uh, wired into um, state initiatives that are put on by the um, uh, Maryland Department of Transportation around pedestrian safety. And so we can tap tap in with them to say, what programs do you have? What messages would be you know best practice? But all but basically the responsible parties are transportation and police department and saying, here's what we think the content should be. However, the delivery, the creation of the PSA and the delivery, whether it's the cost from uh, newspaper articles or television ads or whatever, that is all borne by bus patrol because it's part of their contract. Thank Can you. you. And I'm, I just have one last question. Um, Can you hold on? We'll go back to Mr. McMillian and then we'll circle back to you so everybody gets a chance to ask questions. Mr. McMillian. Sure. I'm. We talked about this approximately, I don't know, a year, year and a half ago. And I'm curious is what's changed on the transportation, public school transportation horizon that has brought this back to us in such a relatively short period of time? That's question number one, but go ahead. So you're right. So about 18 months ago, we did bring this before the board and part of the um, questions, um, quite frankly, that the board asked was they felt it was, um, why, why were we piggybacking? Because at that time we we're piggybacking Howard County's contract. And um, uh, so I think that was one of the primary questions. And so we did take some of that feedback back and um, we issued a request for information. And that was out to any and all uh, vendors in this space. Um, to see what products, what services are in, in the space, what products or services exist. And after we got that information, that helped us to draft 
a request for a proposal. So we said we want a suite of, of um, uh, products, if you will, that can come together to make a robust uh, student safety and school bus initiative. And um, that is what we received. We believe it is good timing because we, we strongly, um, we know that, that it, it makes sense to address student safety as thoroughly, but as, as quickly as we can. Um, so we, we have done quite a bit of, of research um, the first time and we've just continued that research and bring it uh, forward now. Um, and speaking with the police department, we know that um, they've seen an increase in speed camera violations and, and red light camera violations. So um, we believe the timing is is um, appropriate now. And just okay. to opinion, just to piggyback on that too, I, I think with the uh, the pandemic, Mr. McMillian, the um, you know there's there's more parents that are concerned about uh, student ridership, communication, some of those kinds of issues, some of the technologies that were that we're onboarding um, in terms of student safety will eventually help us to to improve in in some of those areas. Um, I think it's also important to note that many of the jurisdictions around us have onboarded similar projects. Howard Counties has come online since uh, we last brought this to the board. Carroll Counties has come online. Charles Counties has come online. Queen Anne Queen Anne's Counties has come online, and so has PG Counties. So um, you know we think that statewide this is one of those initiatives or um, one of those safety measures that that many of us are adopting within the industry. And and besides what you've already shared in the in the previous couple of minutes about the benefits, are there any other benefits to Baltimore County Public Schools and our students that that you haven't mentioned up to this point? Sure, and thank you so much for that question, Mr. McMillian. I think it might just be appropriate to go over the, the full suite. And so, um, so we spent some time talking about the exterior cameras, um, but that really is only one, one portion of this, of this initiative. Um, the others are a new and upgraded interior camera package. And so that would add the number of cameras on buses. It also adds the, um, it changes them up to a high definition camera with wide angle. Um, those cameras would be able to be remotely accessed. So right now we physically go out to a school bus, we pull a hard drive, we bring into an office, and we sit in um, a, a proprietary device and we use our use a proprietary software to pull the data. Um, this program is set up that we would be able to make a request, an electronic request via via computer. Um, and that wirelessly accesses the bus it's through um, cellular connectivity. It accesses the bus's hard drive to retrieve camera footage. So that is a significant move forward for our office. Additionally, we would be able to remotely access. And so unfortunately, they've been, there have been a number of incidents where um, school safety will call and say, hey, this is going on on a school bus. What do we know? And we don't know anything or we're waiting for someone to give us a call, we will be able to actually tap into a bus and see what is happening at any time. So that's the interior cameras. Um, we talked about the communication component. The system also comes with a pre and post trip electronic, um, uh, electronic um, storage um, system. So um, school bus drivers and attendants are required to do a pre trip and post trip before and after. So. Um, once they get to their bus and they turn it on, they have to go around and make sure that the vehicle is safe to operate. Well, there is a, a component to electronically document that it has been completed. Um, the system will come with um, tablets on school buses, and those tablets allow us to have some level of student ridership. And so it is tied into our writing software. So um, we would uh, be able to, if we as a system chose to go this route, we would be able to um, uh, package which students are getting on and, and off at certain stops. That requires some other things like students to have ID cards, et cetera. But the system is able to do so. Also, the, the tablets on buses allow the drivers to sign in. 
And so the bus knows, OK, you are performing route one, two, three, and it can actually give them um, some level of directions. And this is uh, critically helpful when we have drivers who are covering other routes. We're able to better support drivers on routes for which they're unfamiliar um, because we'd be able to electronically send that down. OK, um, I'm sorry. That's fine. Another component um, are cameras outside of the bus that would allow drivers to to physically see if there are uh, students or pedestrians near the bus when the bus has finished a bus stop. And so right now we have a device that is a it's a um, a picture of a bus with with lights around it that detect motion. Well, in this upgrade, we would have actual cameras, much like many new new cars, where you can see around the vehicle, where you'd be able to see if there was a student. And I think finally, it does give an upgrade to our current routing system. So um, that actually moves uh, our current routing system into a um, cloud-based. And I should say, last but not least, it does come with a um, a mobile device um, and, and many people refer to it as a parent app where um, you would allow access to certain routes and you would be able to get on that that app and see how far out a bus is to a certain bus stop. OK, I, I have one last question. It, it all sounds good. But you know, a lot of people complain that, you know, we don't utilize route finder to its fullest. We have two way radios that aren't installed. How do, do we have the staff to implement this to and get the maximum that we possibly can out of this? Uh, do we have the staff that we can do this? It's a great question. Um, so. We do have the staff. Um, I think there will be a redirect of, of staff um, task. Um, so some staff who may be focused on one thing will be um, changed to focus on something different at some point. Um, and as we bring on various components of the the of this package, we may see that we need to um, modify uh, more staff responsibilities. However, our our staff is poised to to implement. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. West. Um, Mr. Offerman, do you have any questions? Um, hearing none, I have a quick follow up question, Mr. West, or maybe this is for Mr. Sarris. How many RFPs were received and what was the criteria used for vendor evaluation? Ms. Jez, this is George Sarris. We, we did two RFPs. Uh, the first one yielded uh, only one response. Uh, we we reissued the solicitation. We got uh, two competitive. Let's see, two or three. Um, just looking for the evaluations. Um, Yeah, we received two responses, both competitive, and the highest ranked uh, was selected. And in the uh, email responses to the questions that you provided us, uh, we listed the criteria, uh, the technical approach, the basic requirements, the profile of the firm, the presentation itself, and the pricing and uh, along with lots of uh, details under each of these uh, general categories. And Ms. Jones, I just wanted to add in, um, you mentioned the word evaluation. A component of this um, uh, RFP was just that, evalu the evaluation component. And so the evaluation, and an evaluation committee was established. And um, I, because I was writing the contract, I was actually not on the evaluation committee. The, com the committee comprised of a school administrator, the Office of School Safety, um, a, a member from the 
Baltimore County's Department of Budget and Finance, a captain in our police department from Baltimore County, um, and two members from the Office of Transportation, and I believe that's it. So it was a, a comprehensive evaluation panel that was put together. I'm sorry, and um, someone from the Office of Information Technology, from the Department of Information Technology. And so that was a, a comprehensive evaluation team that was put together to uh, evaluate the, the proposals that were submitted in response to the RFP. Did we miss? Did we lose Miss Jose? It looked like. I think it. she may have just exited accidentally. It, Mr. Ross, it looked like that. If you have any more questions, why don't you go ahead and ask those while we All try right. to pull her back up? I do. Okay, thank you. Um, so one of the questions I had before, and I still have, and I I, I really would like to get to this. We we talk about safety. Um. And uh, I would like to understand how this provides safety to students. Mr. Kuhn, I can answer that that question, and, and I and I believe, if I may, I, I think you had an additional question um, some time ago regarding a, a physical stop arm and and some of those uh, pieces and, and why you know were they considered in this so as Mr. West said we did an RFI uh, prior to doing an RFP and as part of that we um, we entertained all any types of um, safety initiatives and proposals while students embark disembark and, and ride the school bus so in terms of a physical stop arm, just to, to address that, there are a few products that are available um, nationwide that have a like a like a physical arm, if you will. Uh, none of those products have been approved by uh, the Maryland Department of Transportation and MBA. Um, so none of, none of them are available for use in the in the state of Maryland at this particular time. Um, so that's important important to note. Uh, plus, the manufacturers of those have been unable to provide any evidence for us around um, what happens when when that physical arm is violated. So you, the damage that it that it could do to the other motorist, the damage that it could do to a pedestrian, the damage it could do to the school bus or the physical arm itself. Um, so we did look at at any and all types of um, of safety. Uh, pieces that any company wanted to provide to us as, as part of the RFI process. And so um, a big part of the safety piece is changing motorist behavior. As Mr. West said, that's that's our primary goal is, is student safety. So one of the things that I would liken it to is as the as the uh, motoring public becomes educated in, in this work and in this initiative, um, we often see that, you know, the county runs there. Uh, they have red light cameras. They have um, speed cameras. And so most most of us and, and I'm a resident of Baltimore County. We know where many of those exist, um, even if it's in the back of our head and we slow down on a particular street or we know that there's a red light camera or the possibility of it. Um, it cautions us. We think twice about it. So this particular initiative is as the public understands that that there is a law, they're breaking the law as they violate the stop arm. Um, we hope that it will change behavior and, and uh, produce safety. Some of the other features that are part of this package, uh, Mr. West mentioned the uh, the wide uh, angle interior cameras, for example, that um, that will be a, a tremendous upgrade for us, allow more uh, coverage not only inside the bus than what we have now, but in, in much sharper images um, and particularly coming off the pandemic. We know that that's been um, one of the challenges that our school based administrators have had when there have been an incident on the bus or when they've been doing contact tracing or, or some of that other important work. So we look at this as, as really a holistic package. Um, the, the parent app, which will allow schools and, and parents to, um, you know, to see where their bus is, is, is certainly 
really that piece of communication that also leads to safety when we talk about you know buses being on time both in the morning for school and as they um, leave schools in the afternoon. So again, this is a real comprehensive comprehensive approach to student safety and um, the stop arm uh, cameras are just one component of that. OK, so. Lots of points you covered a lot there uh, regarding the physical arms, right? Um, you know that regardless of the outcome, if somebody hit it, what what the damage might be. The, the reason why I actually threw that out there is because it prevents something from happening. Like that's the point. These cameras are there to find people and it's an after the fact issue at that point. A child's been struck by a car or someone is driven by, right? And then we are we are in essence, you know, sending them a violation and collecting money. It's a revenue generator. So I see it for what it is, okay? And I saw it for what it was before. And now it seems as if they've added a few other things to try and sweeten the deal and the offer. Again, my concern is how are we preventing this? There is nothing keeping Baltimore County and the police and even and even us from doing public service announcements now. We could do that right now. Every day we could send stuff home with people. We could multi-channel it and send it out. We could call every household in the county that we're associated with and talk about bus safety. I don't know if we do any of that now. I think we should just constantly do it. But I don't want to wait for a contract like this to try and reach out and to execute on those things. And I have no idea, and I asked about that, what is the community, community education all about? What kind of money is gonna be behind it? Because commercials cost money if we're actually gonna do TV commercials, radio commercials, things along those lines. But I don't understand how much money is gonna to come to the table or how that would change it. And these are things we can do now. So again, I don't see this as preventive in nature, and that's a challenge. Now. If you guys could bring to me or if there's information that exists out there that says this does modifies modifies people behavior and in studies it shows a reduction of X amount over time, that would be great. That would be something at least to look at. I don't know where it exists or if it exists. Um, I understand red light cameras can even cause accidents because people jam on the brakes when they would have cruised through a yellow light safely. So I understand there might be, um, you know, other things that occur uh, um, from an ex, you know, part of, you know, a, a contract or a, a way to move forward on, on something like this that we're not anticipating. Um, but I, I, you know, I do appreciate your time, and um, I know we have other contracts to get through. Yeah. So I'm going to thank I'm you. Stop Mr. asking Jim. questions now. Thank you. Thank you. There's a lot of questions and board members could email them in the interest of time at 610. Um, also, you know, if you could keep your questions pertaining to the contract and not so much about um, the background and trying to understand what, what's going on, which is also important, but that can be answered uh, via email. Um, I do have a quick question. Um, was there any conflict of interest check that was performed? Uh, and and also in terms um, of the uh, the evaluation team all sign a uh, a disclosure uh, mm -hmm. certifying there is no conflict of interest. Okay, so but that's yeah, the contract. That, yeah. And also, is it possible for um, the board to see a draft MOU prior to the board meeting tomorrow? I know it, it won't be signed until we approve the contract, but if we could get a look at the contract, uh, at the MOU, the Memorandum of Understanding, that would actually help and quell some of the questions that board members have, I believe. So if uh, we will hold on any more questions and we'll email them in the interest of time, Mr. Saris will um, proceed with the next contract. OK, uh, I did hear from Dr. Zarchin that he has a staff person available now. If if you so wish to go back to item two um, on the mindfulness 
contract? Um, is that something that we can address tomorrow at the board meeting? Yeah, we can have that same person available. Okay, yes, that would be great. Okay. That way the full board can hear that as well. And so we'll just move to the next contract. Okay, the next item, JMI 618-18 Information Technology Staffing Services. And this is an assignment um, of the Array Information Technology um, Company to our ERP provider in this case, which is CGI Technologies and solutions who acquired this uh, in a purchase. Board members, are there any questions? Um, Ms. Jones, I have just a quick question. Just to confirm, there is no other change except for the name, meaning they were bought and, and that's all it's changing on this. Correct. Yeah, uh, except that we do, we now have 59 providers instead of 58. So uh, CGI was not listed previously, I do not believe. And so uh, that's correct. So by them acquiring this provider, we now, um, oh wait, that doesn't make sense. Yeah, because the other one you have says there are 26 other awarded vendors. So this one's 59. It's kind of worked its way into two separate contracts here. Um, 61, 618-18 talks about oh, 59 that, other yeah. awarded vendors, right? Right. That's what we're talking about right now. Yeah, so it is, it is. Um, there's still only one provider with a different name, yes. Okay, and then... I do have a question because I'm looking at the numbers at the bottom of this one and it says lifetime contract expenditure, $13.3 million. Um, and then it says anticipated lifetime contract expenditure, expenditure, 14.8 million. But that doesn't add up because it looks as if we spend over $2 million a year. So at least, right? So are we going to breach that 14.8 million amount there? Um, let's see. It certainly looks that way. That's why I asked the question. Yeah, uh, I think that's a good question. So, um, do you want to come back to us tomorrow? Yeah, you? I think I'll let me just check and see if I have the report. Sometimes that helps. Um, I do have the same question with the, the next 614-18. Uh, uh, it's along the same lines and it also shows over $15 million already spent for a total of 17.3 million. And it looks like we spend, we spent over 3.4 million this year. So um, it looks like we're gonna breach that amount also. Okay, let's see here. Possibly. Yeah, I think it would be most expedient for me just to bring that uh, either email that information uh, tonight um, or bring it with me tomorrow, but hopefully I'll have an answer tonight. And I'll Mr. just Sarah, email that. May I weigh in? This is Mr. Corns. Um, JMI 618-18 um, is the staffing contract for our professional IT services. And um, we have been on track to annually return that to the board for a spending authority increase. So um, the expenditure of the contract tends to uh, mirror the annual expenditure. And so this contract uh, is uh, out of cycle right now because of this name change. But after this, we'll be returning it again um, I believe around June or July for a spending authority increase uh, as have we done in the past several years. I think that is the correct answer, Mr. Kuhn. All right, thanks. That would make sense. Yeah. <laughs> we don't want to run out of money on your contracts and have, yeah. have everything stop. Thank um, you, Mr. Okay. Sarah. Are there any more questions, board members? Hearing Mr. none, Mr. Sarah. I put it. Yeah, go ahead, Ms. Um, I was just 
going to ask a clarifying question that might answer Mr. Kuhn's question. I was wondering if the lifetime um, contract expenditures included the current fiscal year expenditures, in which case we wouldn't overrun the um, current authority. Because I was doing the same math Mr. Kuhn was and wondering the same thing myself. But if it if the lifetime includes the current fiscal year, then I don't think we would. But based on what Mr. Porn said, if it's coming back. Ms. Then based on based on our procurement practice, um, we encumber these funds at the beginning of the fiscal year, so in July. So um, my experience is that the numbers that Mr. Saris are providing to you do include my encumbrances for this year. Uh, we've dramatically decreased the number of contractors we have, but the ones that we do, we encumber them for the fiscal year at the beginning of the fiscal year so as to account for the funding. Okay, so does the, the lifetime then include the current fiscal year expenditure, so, Mr. Sarris? Uh, let's see here. We now our reporting capabilities have not been what they were, but the uh, we tend to only show the actual expended amounts rather than the encumbered amounts. So um, that's been our past practice, and uh, I think that it's probably um, correct, but that's something I'll have to verify and, and provide later this evening. Okay. But my question was clear, what I'm asking. Yes. The 3.6 included in the 13.3. Well, the 3.6 is, and uh, yeah, that I do understand the question. Thanks. Okay, I just want to make sure I'm stating it clearly. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. So. Thank you. The, Go ahead, Mr. Terry. Did you want me to move on to the next item? Yes, please, we... thank you. OK, so the next item, JMI 614-18, Technology Support Staffing Services. Uh, wait a minute, I just did that. OK, um, LLY 402-22, Internet Service Provider. This is a new competitively, competitively bid contract for an internet service provider for the Office of Network Services. Approval is requested for a five-year contract with uh, the option for five one-year extensions and total contract spending authority of $4,269,120. Mr. members, any questions? And, Ms. And yeah, go ahead. I have a few Before, questions. Oh, go ahead, Mr. Kuhn. Thanks. Uh, just so that I'm clear, um, what is the annual budget that we're expecting to spend on this? So I will defer to Mr. Uh, Corns on this. Is it the two hundred twenty thousand? What's reported 000? is eight hundred forty thousand dollars. Yeah, so um, Mr. Kuhn, it's it's um, we're, we're roughly in the neighborhood of about a million dollars a year. So that eight hundred thousand dollar figure that uh, Mr. Saris just quoted. Okay. All right. I'm I'm just trying to make sense of the numbers underneath the, the total contract spending authority, and this because uh, I I read the notes below, and it actually talks about like decreases in costs. Um, it, it it looks as if there are some decreases in costs uh, monthly for us. Is that accurate, Mr. Corns? And in, in addition to increase in bandwidth. So yes, Mr. Green, uh, part of this uh, contract cycle um, also involves our E-rate. Um, our E-rate application. So we'll, we were bringing this contract early so that we can start this service for the, the role of the fiscal year, but it's uh, in line with uh, being able to be eligible for our reimbursements on E-rate. 
So uh, there's, um, it's a little more competitive of a market out there uh, for internet services, especially since we've stepped up to a new um, threshold uh, going from 40 to 60 gigs. Okay, and just so that we all clearly understand, when you say we'll be getting rebates or through via e rebate or e, e rate, I'm sorry. Yes, sir. Um, what does that look like? So, How much um, are we talking about? So, in general, um, our e rate reimbursement, given our um, free and reduced lunch counts, uh, hovers around 60% of uh, monies expended. Uh, important note to make is that it's an expend out and then returns back to the count to the Baltimore County Public Schools uh, uh, budget as a revenue source. So it's a budgeted revenue in the next fiscal year. So the money we'll expend in the 22-23 school year will re be returned back to us in the 23-24 school year. Uh, so we received an E-rate re reimbursement this year for last year's expenditure. So it's a little out of cycle for our normal budget process, uh, but we uh, on average get about 60% of the money we expend on internet back. Okay, and then does that money go back into paying for this next year? Is that what we do? Um, it is returned to the general ledger. Uh, so I, Mr. Saris could speak probably speak a little more eloquently to it, but it is part of the calculation of our revenue. So um, it it is in, in kind of the base amount of money that we are budgeted uh, in general in the school system. So we then would expend the money in my budget to buy the internet. So it could be said that it's in there to buy that again. But it's not specifically line items to do that. Okay, I ask just to, to understand sure. how we handle that. Mr. Saris, where does our revenue yes, go it, and how do we direct it? It is one of the few, uh, I mean, it, it's one of our general revenues, as Mr. Korn says, uh, because uh, it's, it's not revenue in the strictest sense, it's a refund, a partial refund of what we've already spent. So, um, if you look on, uh, let's see here. If you look in the uh, uh, the budget under revenues on page 66 uh, of this year's budget, you'll see um, it's, I guess it's not broken out, but under other, uh, revenue, uh, the E-rate is included in the $3.6 million. Um, and I suppose, uh, I think there's a new format that the program has adopted, which uh, will give us um, a more direct, uh, in other words, they'll pay for services rather than uh, doing this reimbursement, uh, but but this uh, funding model is is still a reimbursement, so we show it uh, as revenue, but we have to spend it first. All right, thank you, sir. Sure. Committee members, any more questions? If there are none, Mr. Terrace, please proceed with the next contract. Okay. Uh, JMI 615-18, Building Renovation and alter, uh, Alteration Services. Um, this may be something Mr. Dixit wants to pick up with, if not, Pete. Thank you, George, me. and good okay. afternoon to everybody. Good afternoon or good evening now, I guess. So the next contract, JMI 615-18, is for building renovation and alteration. Uh, this contract is used for small construction jobs. Uh, they are less than $300,000. There's a typo in this contract that I'd like to share with you where we have previous contract spending authority. It should read 13 million and not 19 million 350. We'll correct it. 
the request is for adding six million three hundred and fifty thousand dollars so the revised total contract spending authority is nineteen million three hundred and fifty thousand Any questions? Oh, Ms. Joe's just a quick question. This is Mr. Kuhn. So this is a mix of operating and capital budgets. That um, that's correct. So what's is there a specific breakdown like 60-40 or 10-90? What how does that work? So it depends on the job. What we have shared with you that uh, the total amount spent in last year someplace is three million six hundred and fifty three thousand two ninety four was spent in operating that that was the total expenditure and i have a split of here yeah uh, one million five hundred thousand five hundred for capital projects and four million 850,000 for operating budget, but this can change, but that was what is spent so far on the amount that we spent. Oh, OK, I'm I'm sorry that just confused me. You said that. That that total more than we than it said that we spent last year. So the amount that I have is. Uh, I'm just looking at the prior fiscal year contract expenditure, 3.6 million, and you just said 1.5 million plus 4.5 million. So, if I'm, I maybe I misheard you. Yeah, what I said is the additional spend authority, the additional spending authority of 6 million, the one that we are requesting, it consists of million five for capital projects and four million eight hundred fifty thousand for for the operating budget. OK, that's what the 6.3. All right, thank you. I thought you were explaining what we spent last year and I'm sorry if I missed. Oh, no, that's my bad. All right, thank you. No further questions from me. Thank you. Committee members, any questions? If there are any missing, please proceed to the next contract. So the next contract is JME-508-22 is for construction management services. And it sounds like a big amount, so a little bit of background explanation. The term of the contract is four years, so it comes to about $12.5 million per year. And this is a budget estimated price. And the construction management cost typically runs around six to eight percent of the project cost we select what services do we need and for what contract so the projected expenditure is 12.5 million dollar per year over period next four years uh, committee members any questions Uh, Mr. Dixit, I have sent a couple of questions regarding this contract via email. If, if staff could answer that through email, that would be appreciated. Absolutely. I do have a question here. I believe you email, uh, but it may have come from some other board member. And that was about scope of services for uh, the contract. And the scope of service really vary from uh, contract to contract. In some cases, it may be construction management. In some cases, it may be value engineering. In some cases, maybe additional staff uh, that we can use from the contract. So that's the answer in brief, but we'll be glad to answer any more questions you have. And do you have any um, MBWB goals for this contract overall? So uh, MBE goals will be set for each project to achieve the minimum or greater level of participation re required by the board or by county. Ms. Jez, this is George Saris, and our our minimum goal for subcontractors is 15%, but 
it may be that uh, none of these uh, proposals that we receive from these pre-qualified uh, vendors may have subcontractors uh, and so in that case uh, we would not uh, be able to or required to meet that 15 percent threshold. What would be the reasoning for them not to have a goal for something as large as $50 million um, that's spread out, I believe, over multiple years, but it is something that the board would require or the county would require to have. Um, there should be multiple vendors that would have applied with multiple subcontractors for doing some of the work that they perhaps couldn't. So what is the requirement for not having that goal? Um, I'm going to ask uh, my MBE officer. You can respond to that yeah. prior to tomorrow's email. I'm not going to put you in a spot, but uh, if okay. are there any more questions, committee members? Hearing none, Ms. Sissick, so please proceed with the next contract. So the next contract, JBO-706-22, is Desktop Delivery Office Supplies. So what it is, this will provide for legal and letter size paper for schools and offices. Oh, members, this is, any questions? Yeah, go ahead. Sorry, this is mine. Um, as we uh, have reported uh, previously to the committee and to the full board, uh, we are experiencing a number of supply disruptions. Um, We've taken some expedited contracts and uh, next month we'll even have an emergency contract to present. Uh, we were unable to obtain basic eight and a half by 11 legal cut paper uh, with under our current contract. So we have uh, entered into uh, this agreement in order to keep uh, our schools and offices uh, supplied with paper. And it's uh, we're using a, a, a Michigan, uh, Oakland County, Michigan contract. The prior, our, our standard contract was also a cooperative with Montgomery County Public Schools, and we're all just having trouble getting supplies. Thank you. Committee members, do you have any questions? Mr. Q? No questions, ma'am. Ms. Hen? No questions. All right, thank you. If there are no more questions, Mr. Sarris or Mr. Dixit, please proceed with the next contract. So the next contract, ASI-804-22, is for door hardware and associated material. This is a five-year contract. Our expenditure rate, as we have shared here, uh, is close to 200,000, it's 196,916. Uh, so based on that trend, we are asking for at the rate of about $200,000 per year. Thank you. Committee members, any questions? Hearing none, Mr. Dixit, please proceed with the next contract. So next we have a series of uh, two or three different board exhibits. That's for parts uh, and supplies. Uh, there are several different contracts because they cover different manufacturers. So the contract GDA 314-22 is for industrial and building supplies with related equipment. This is a new contract for HVAC and other supplies that we use uh, in maintaining our mechanical and other systems. And I'll just add that uh, there are two other HVAC contracts. What we attempted to do initially was uh, our own uh, competitive bid and, you know, based on our volume and the size of our needs, um, we, we weren't able to gain any interest in that bid, so 
uh, we uh, went to three different providers in order to ensure that we have supplies for all the different brands of equipment that we use and uh, and we're bringing these three cooperative agreements instead of a single competitive bid. Thank Jones, you. I have a quick question. Go ahead. So we I'm just curious, do we use any of the supplies or provide them to schools for students to actually learn on? I know we provide um, an HVAC track, I believe, in at least one of our magnets. Would this be where we get some of those materials or no? So if we ever got that, that will be an exception. Um, to my knowledge, this is for our folks, our in-house team providing maintenance services to equipment in the building. But I don't think anything prohibits for buying for students. And George, correct me if I'm wrong. No, that's correct, Pete. And we do have, uh, we have contracts for both plumbing and electrical supplies that are specifically um, tailored to include, but in other words, they're, the spending authority is is based on including those needs because they're all basic industry standard parts. Um, we, I think if it were the case in this with HVAC materials, we would have specified it. Okay, thank you. I was just curious since we have some of these programs across the system, how I don't know how we source those materials for the students to learn and use. So. Thank you. Ms. Jones, I have a question. Roger, no, Mr. Pete, so you mentioned in-house like mechanics, so all these different parts. So if we have a situation at school, our in-house mechanics would use these parts to fix whatever we need, correct? That's correct. Okay, and if we were in a situation where we had to go to an outside vendor to come in, because they was, the job was too big for us or whatever, they would provide their own parts and everything to fix whatever we need fixed, correct? That's correct. Okay, thank you. And I did but get again, a note. But, but, uh, but again, nothing prevents us from providing them a part at the cost if that part is needed by them and they do not have it and we have it in our storeroom. Thank you. So the next one is, uh, we talked about ASI 809-22, and then there's another one, ASI 810-22 for HVAC refrigeration and equipment. So these contracts are just with different vendors to supply parts for different manufacturers that are used in different systems. And I did get... Go ahead, Mr. Uh, I did get confirmation that the CTE program would use uh, these vendors for its HVAC program. Thank you. Any questions, committee members? Hearing none, Mr. Dixon, please proceed to the next contract. The next contract, JBO-701-22, is for paint and associated material. And uh, as it says, it will provide paint or any other material for our in-house shop to use for the job that we do uh, using our forces. And the contract, the, the vendor is Sherman Williams, uh, recognized name. Thank you, Mr. Dixit. Committee members, any questions? Hearing none, Mr. Dixit, please proceed to the next contract. So the next contract is CWA-107-22 for stone, mulch, topsoil, and other material that is needed uh, in the grounds maintenance and field maintenance, gardens, playgrounds. Committee members, any questions? Mr. 
we should just say, um, how many how many um, vendors responded to this contract? So we have six vendors. Uh, more than likely, they all provide different material. Some of them may provide more than one material. Right, and we have uh, price quotes for the different uh, quantities, types of stone, you know, uh, types of sand, mulch, playground mulch, rubberized mulch. Uh, there's about 15 different items and each of the vendor that uh, can provide has offered us uh, a price per ton uh, delivered um, i think it's or price per yard for mulch for example um, and we can use any of these get the quoted price uh, if one of them if the lowest price isn't available we go to the next lowest so there's unit pricing for all of this material. Right. Thank you, Mr. Dixit. Um, if there are no questions, committee members, uh, we will proceed to the next contract. So the next contract is JBO 702-22, and that's for the repair parts for the grounds equipment. So there's large quantity of grounds equipment that we have and it requires maintenance. So um, these uh, contractors that we have on the list, All Roads Kubota, Gambrels Equipment and Security Equipment, we use them for getting parts to repair our own equipment. Committee members, any questions? Mrs. Millian? Hearing none, Mr. Dixit, please proceed to the next contract. So the next contract, I believe the last one is JME 502-22, and that's for roof replacement at Cedarmere Elementary School. Uh, this uh, project was part of the capital program that board has already approved, and there were multiple bidders. Uh, about seven bidders and the lowest bidder is Patuxent Roofing and Contracting. And so the request is to award the contract to the lowest bidder. Committee members, any questions? Mr. Dixit, this, um, this budget dollars comes out of the capital budget, correct? That's correct. <clears throat> So it's one of the systemic projects uh, that board approved as part of the capital plan. All right, thank you. Are there any more questions, committee members? I have a question for you, Ms. Jones. Can we can we vote to move these out of committee um, instead of voting to approve them? We can separate out if there are specific contracts, and I was going to ask that to the committee members. If there are a couple of contracts, which I, I am looking at it myself, that I would like to separate out, but I would like to approve the rest in the interest of time for the full board. I believe contract um, four, and we could con contract um, seven. We could separate those out if those are the ones, or is there any other that you would like to separate out? Yeah, my, my request is to separate out three, four, five, and six. Three, four, yeah, so five, and six. So one, two, seven through 18. So yes, that's my request, please. All right, um, so do I have a motion to approve contracts one through two and seven through 18? Move to the full board for approval. So moved, Offerman. Thank you, Mr. Offerman. Is there a second? Second, Kuhn. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Slade, please call the roll. Those in favor, please say aye. Those opposed, please say no. 
Ms. Hen. Yes. Mr. Kuhn. Yes. Mr. McMillian. Aye. Mr. Offerman. Yes. Ms. Jose. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so contracts one through two and seven through 18 will be moved to the full board uh, for approval. And do I have a motion to do, and do I need a motion to just move this to the full board to the other remaining contracts, Mr. Or? Well, I, th I think typically you take a vote on. Uh, Each one separately. Yeah. Well, I want you. I, did the board, did the committee just approve? one through two and seven through 18 or recommend Correct. approval yeah yes um, and then i think you would just indicate that the remainder would move forward without a recommendation okay so contract uh three through seven is that correct mr kuhn i think it's three four five and six seven i think we moved right so it's the four of them, three, four, five, and six. C, D, E, and F. Is that right? So I'm I'm sorry. I'm just yes. looking at the main. Yes, that agenda. I have C, D, E, and F. Thank you. Sorry, I'm just taking notes. Here. Um. So contract C, D, E, and F will be moved to the full board without recommendation. Is there any further business? Uh, Ms. Any Jones, questions? Ms. Yeah. Excuse me. Uh, do we need a um, motion and a second for the remainder remaining contracts to move to the full board without a recommendation? I can move it. So, do I have a motion to move contract C, D, E, and F? to the full board without recommendation. So moved. Second. Seconded, Kim. Thank you, committee members. Ms. Slate, please call the roll. Um, those in favor, please say aye. Those opposed, please say no. Ms. Hen? Yes. Mr. Kuhn? Abstain. Mr. McMillian? Aye. Mr. Offerman? I'm sorry, Mr. Offerman? Yes. And Ms. Jose? Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Slade. Contract C, D, E, and F will be moved to the full board without recommendation. Contracts 1 through 2 and 7 through 18 moved to the board recommended by the committee. Uh, if there are no further business, this meeting is adjourned. Good night, everybody. Thank you. Good night. Thank you. Good night. Good night.